thank you, everyone. I think we can uh, start the meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors. Uh, it looks like six thirty-four. Um, we've got uh, Amanda's going to be a little late, but she should get here in time for the legislative discussion. Um, is Kristen online? Yep. Chris is online, Anna can't, cannot make it, unfortunately. Um, and um, very pleased tonight to have uh, members from the delegation that represents Montpelier, Roxbury, and Washington County uh, for a discussion in a few minutes uh, once we um, go through some initial business. Uh, so first uh, order is public comment. Um, we don't have anyone in the room. Uh, is there anyone online who uh, wishes to make public comment? Please either raise your your hand uh, with the raise hand function, or if you want, you can just unmute yourself and and uh, let yourself be known. No, excellent. Uh, consent agenda. Do I have a Motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. So a second. A second. Um, any discussion? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, great consent agenda passes. Um, great, so we'll move on. Um, thank you uh, to, let's try to see who's on. My eyes are not as good as they used to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to uh, Senator Perslick, uh, Representative Hooper, uh, Senator Cummings. Am I missing anyone? So. Uh, and I think we might have a couple more joining. Um, for joining us for a discussion, yeah, obviously this um, last couple of years have been uh, extraordinary ones for all school districts. Uh, our district, you know, no exception to that. Um, we've definitely appreciated the support the legislature has gotten us. Uh, and in some ways, you know, I think we're in a more fortunate position than we thought we would be. A lot of the financial hardships that that many thought would come to pass um, thus far have not. And if anything, we've we've actually seen uh, unanticipated, particularly federal money. Um, but even the money from the state has been uh, strong and certainly much stronger than predicted. So thanks to the efforts that everyone played in making that happen and, and continue to make that happen. And in other ways, this has been more challenging than we thought. The uh, uh, the virus has certainly lingered lingered with us longer than than anticipated. Uh, it seems to do good jobs of of ducking and weaving uh, every time we feel we've we've passed a milestone. Uh, I know just talking to uh, administrators and and teachers and people around the school districts that in some ways this this year has been a lot harder than last year. Um, because of a variety of factors, uh, I think burnout, fatigue, and and the lack of predictability, and also the lack of of a seeming end in sight, has have been uh, you know some of the factors that have really I think started to to wear people out in ways that that um, weren't happening uh, before. And you know, with that, you know, we have been very fortunate to have our school, our kids in schools uh, most days. Um, I know some kids are really suffering, but. Uh, I think because we've been able to be in school, we've been able to limit the number of kids, uh, you know, who are highly impacted by this. Um, not to say that there are, um, you know, impacts we really need to deal with, but um, we have been able, and a lot of it's been through the heroic efforts of our our educators and, and the leaders of our educators. Uh, we have been able to to navigate this situation um, probably about as as well as possible. Um, you know, that said, I think everyone is looking for some relief and, and an upturn um, and an end in sight. Uh, and we really wanted to have a discussion uh, about some of <clears throat> the things in this legislature that we as district should uh, be watching for, um, share some ideas with you, uh, you know, and hopefully uh, be prepared to kind of work together as we move through this legislative session to both uh, get us out of COVID um, hopefully in better shape than we came into it. Um, and also just talk about some other issues that I know are out there, um, uh, two of which I know are on the agenda. One is um, the uh, equalized pupil uh, changes to how equalized pupils are calculated uh, and you know, what we should be thinking about in that regard. 
Uh, and then uh, I think, I don't wanna put Red on the spot, but I know Red could well explain some of the challenges we've had as, as can Kristen uh, with uh, some of the, uh, some of the laws around how uh, districts can go about voting. We've got a, a couple issues where uh, inconsistencies between the, the two towns approach have had, I think, unanticipated consequences um, on mail and ballot voting, for instance, and the ability of, of non-citizen residents to vote. So uh, with that, why don't um, I, I hand it over to, um, uh, to the senators and representatives to introduce themselves and just have the floor to uh, you know, talk about uh, the perspective from, from the state house and uh, some of the things that, that you've been seeing and that you feel we should, we should have our eye on and then we can just open it up to the board for um, comments and Q&A. Uh, well, yeah, you either go, you can either do a popcorn or I can, I can call on you. Why don't you, why don't you start Senator Cummings since it looks like you're ready to go. Okay. Um, I'm Ann Cummings and I, uh, represent Washington County in the Vermont Senate. I chair the finance committee. Finance deals with property taxes. We deal with taxes. Um, my committee has just started. We've been assigned in the waiting study to look at the weights, um, to look at whether or not we should do a weight, or I think they're calling them an equity payment, more of a grant. Um, I'm watching Senator Perchlick because he was on the committee. So uh, I have two members of finance that were also on the summer study committee. So we're going to have to decide if we're going to do grants, weights, um, yeah, or a hybrid, some grants, some weights. We're going to have to uh, develop a transition because we know uh, there will be some big winners and some big losers as we transition out. Um, and into what should be a, a, um, a system that does reflect the actual cost of educating students um, and students uh, particularly that require a little more to educate them. Um, I've asked my committee to follow the example of the um, summer task force and that is we aren't looking at runs, so I don't know who the real winners and losers are in my county. Uh, we're going to try and work to find a system that is equitable, that is just, that is fair, and then we'll run it. And um, some of us will probably guess, but we're going to try and do that and then transition in so there is no... Um, major shock, uh, financial shock to the schools. Uh, you've probably heard a year and a half ago, uh, we were looking at a $150 million deficit in the Ed Fund when this whole COVID hit and the everything shut down. Uh, we're now looking at around a $100 million surplus. The governor has a couple of proposals for that, including giving half of it back in rebates. I think my concern and my committee's concern is making sure that no matter what we do, um, there's adequate funding there because once we get out two years, uh, the growth rate, I think three years out is predicted to be, and I'm looking at representative Hoopy here, like 0.8%. Um, and then there's inflation. And when the feds start playing with interest rates, there's always the danger that we'll cool it too fast and go into recession. So that potential is hanging out there. And we want to make sure that the money is there to fund schools in the future. We also realize that we have a lot of facilities needs and we haven't put any money into that in well over a decade. Um, so uh, we've got a lot of things we're looking at uh, that are impacting schools. 
Good, thank you. Um, I don't know who wants to go next. Um, maybe Senator Persa. Yeah, thank you. And just want to also thank you for your service on the board. And I'm, I'm Andrew Perzik, representing Washington County. And I'm on the Education Committee. And we hear a lot about how stressed and difficult it is for students, parents, teachers, administrators, and school board members. So just really want to shout out appreciation for your work and, and time that you're spending on, on helping our schools in this difficult time. To, to answer the question about things that I thought the school should be aware of, uh, probably in, in an order of least important to most important, but one, I'm, a, I'm on the Transportation and Education Committee, and this year I'm on a third committee, I'm on the apportionment, which is the, like the redistricting of the legislative lines. And I think it's good for school boards to look at those maps. They send it out to the Board of Civil Authorities. I, I haven't really looked at the, the uh, house map all that closely to see if it if it would impact but i think if 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 they actually adopted the the majority reported map it would change your this you know the towns that make up u32 make well I, I, that's u32 um my, but roxbury and montpelier would change a little bit on on who they are so it's just something to, to think about um but the, the waiting study, Senator Cummings talked about how they're taking, they're being the finance committee is gonna really take the weights and there's a whole bunch of different weights or the equity payments, which could be just dollars to the schools directly for those issues of poverty and rurality and size and grades. And uh, Superintendent Bone Steel has been very oh, helpful in that process and coming in to the summer committee and talking and also to the education committee. But in education, we're talking about English as a second language. And Superintendent Bone Steel did come in specifically and talked about the issues that Montpelier Roxbury are having with, with English as a second language or English language learners. So we're going to be taking that on. And the task force recommendation was to do that as a grant and not as weights, which some school districts and people in the state don't like. So it'd be interesting to hear how. The Montpelier Roxbury district thinks about a grant for English language learners instead of instead of the weights. And we just got a new estimate of what that would be, but the proposal coming out of the task force was a base grant of $25,000 plus $5,000 for each additional ELL student that the school had. Um, Act, 1, Act 173 special education is supposed to be finally put into place in July, but there's People talking about it, if the weights and that the funding around weights and ELL aren't done, then we should also postpone Act 173. And I'm hearing for, from some other uh, special educators about maybe postponing some of the other rules that are, that, would, that are to go in place in July. So if you have any comments about Act 173 and special education, I'd be interested to hear those as well. And then the last thing that I would say is the thing that Senator Cummings mentioned at the end of her talk, which was the uh, school structures. We're we did last year a big effort to try to do an assessment and an inventory of all school buildings in the entire state. And we're going to get a dollar number at some point during the session. We know it's going to be a huge number of the deferred maintenance that we have, but it's something that Secretary French is really interested in. So we're working with the Superintendent's Association and others about how we can really help schools with their infrastructure, with their facilities, because the state hasn't been doing any aid for construction for many years now. And I'm particularly interested in the HVAC work that, that we started last year and continuing that with some uh, specifically around renewable and clean heating for schools. It's something I'm particularly interested in. So that's that's what I've been working on and what I think would impact the Montpelier School. Receiving all questions until the end, correct? Yeah. Um, Representative Hooper? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I'm Mary Hooper. I represent Montpelier. I am not sitting where I usually do in my office because, you know, in our house, 
because it's cold. And if my screen is too weird, I can go somewhere else. I can see I'm flickering a bit, but I'm, I'm by the fire next to my dog. So <laughs> tell me if, if I should move. Yeah. Um, You're good. So, it's okay, thanks. Yeah, so I'm the chair of the House Appropriations Committee. So we, we handle the other side of the ledger from Anne um, and uh, she, she's, we just received the governor's uh, budget proposal for FY23 and Anne's mentioned that there are tax proposals within, within his budget that that's how it gets presented to us. Um, you know, significantly, he's suggesting that half of the surplus be returned to property taxpayers. Um, I agree with Anne about the deep concern about the out years. Um, just as you mentioned, Jim, um, you know, we're seeing this extraordinary largesse of the federal government and its stimulative effects throughout the economy. It's, it's been pretty incredible what we're seeing um, now. And next year, the budget project, I mean, the revenue projections are that we will start leveling off and return to that very constrained growth that does not keep up with the, um, the, inflation, the inflationary pressures on the budget. So while we're in a hot time right now, we're I'm just deeply concerned about making really smart investments now that pay off, but also not making commitments that we can't live up to in, in a year or two when, when revenues start, start to level off. Um, one of the other significant, after the waiting study um, work, one of the other really significant efforts of the um, of the summer was the pension task force um, that obviously deeply affects uh, teachers and, as well as state employees. And um, it's it's wonderful to see that there's um, an agreement between you know the public public employees and in and others about what the solution is. I, I, I mentioned the, that in the terms of we're setting, we, we are putting $200 million of general fund um, dollars into the pension puzzle, the, the question there. Um, and what is it exciting about that from a budget standpoint is that it pre-funds the retirement accounts of both the teachers and the state employees and puts us in the way of saving over time of the $8 billion liability there is within those, those the, the two systems and kind of the four obligations within the, in the two systems, it, uh, that $8 billion liability, it buys down about $2 billion worth of liability. So it's a really significant investment. And I have just really deep gratitude to the, um, the, um, st the NEA, the BNEA, as well as the teacher, as the state employees for coming and helping folks solve that problem. Um, I think it's gonna really make a difference. Um, I'm just like all of you, I, I am just really deeply, deeply concerned about the well-being of the whole school community, but, but particularly kids and um, you know, the supports that, um, that are there for them. Um, I've, I've asked the department, I asked the Agency of Human Services, which was in our committee today, to talk, I told them that I wanted mental health to report to us on success beyond six and the funding there and you know the resources that are available 
for you all in, in, at the school level. So I'd love to know what you're thinking about there. Um, there's not, I couldn't see any particular funding um, in the governor's um, budget proposal around that. There is a good deal of talk as you've probably been hearing about uh, CTEs. And I'd be, I'm really curious about Montpelier Roxbury's relationship with the CTE that serves this area. So if you wanted to, I, that's kind of on my list to understand. Um, there's some nice funding for after school programs in the governor's proposal. And again, I'd like to understand how you all are thinking about that. Um, we didn't do anything in the budget adjustment for personal protective equipment for schools because we couldn't figure out how to get it to you quickly enough. I don't know if that's an issue, again, for our school district, but if you have, I, I, I'd love to think about that because we've certainly heard about that from other, other districts. Um, that's the, I, I, I'm sure there's a much longer list, but that's what I jotted down. And I just, I just wanted to end by saying how much I admire the work of everybody in the district. It is just extraordinary what you're doing. And, you know, I, I thank you. Thank, thank you for keeping our kids safe try, and teaching them and just marching through this really rough time. Um, it, it's amazing. And I think you all know that uh, we, that the legislature feels really free on calling on um, Superintendent Von Steele to come up and advise us. And we really appreciate you lending her to us um, for helping us understand the issues you all are facing. So thanks, looking forward to the conversation. Great, thank you. Yes, and I know, I know it'll be, it'll be a joyous going up there. So Bertrick and I are buddies. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so I'll just open it up to the, the board. Um, we got Senator Polina in here too. Oh, great. Um, well, let's give Senator Polina a chance to, to go. Um, uh, just to let you know, uh, Senator Polina, we, the, um, Others on the phone have just kind of given an overview of some of the things on their radar, and then uh, a few of them have asked if for you know things they'd like us to comment on. So um, I'll give give the same opportunity to you. Sure. Well, thanks for having us. Hope it to, thanks. Have a good evening. I serve on as vice chair of the government operations committee, and there's a couple of things that relevant things that we're working on. We're the committee that's going to first approve the pension recommendations. So we've been working hard to understand what's in the pension task force recommendations. We had a public hearing actually last night, and we've been hearing from the both the labor unions as well as the state treasurer and others about the pension issue for the last couple of months, actually, but a lot for the last couple of weeks. We last year we worked on making sure that the pension task force was balanced in its representation of labor folks as well as administration folks. And we made sure that the NEA and the BSCA were well represented on the task force. And that's made a big difference. They, they started out with the need to build a lot of trust on the task force, which took a while to do. But from what, what we can tell right now, the both the labor unions as well as this, this treasurer feel that what, we've, they, what they've come up with is a really good compromise. And it is a compromise, but it's something that will protect the pension system without overburdening teachers or state employees in the short term. And so we're beginning to take a look at that, what's exactly in the proposal. We don't have the bill yet that would codify what's what the recommendations include, but we're hoping to have that next week. We also in government operations, we spend a lot of time trying to make it easy for towns, for towns to function in a way that is safe, function safely, but still be able to function adequately. I know that you've had some things going on in terms of mail out ballots in Montpelier Roxbury district, which, are, which you are permitted to do under the law now, but only if every town agrees to make it happen. And I know there's been some issues around whether or not the town of Roxbury was gonna go ahead with allowing it to happen, but um, we've made it possible for other municipal bodies to like do remote, totally remote meetings and whatnot. And we're trying to make it as easy, easy as possible for people to cast their ballots as well. Um, the, other, the only other thing I would mention is that, like the others that have spoken, I can't really begin to imagine the kind of pressure that you folks are under being in school all day or not, depending on what happens in, in your classroom. 
I mean, the work of teaching is difficult enough and to do it during a pandemic is just unfathomable for most of us to begin to understand. So if there's things that we can do that makes your job easier, we would certainly be willing to take that on. We, we're limited in what we can do because we don't, there's no state of emergency anymore. So we've tried to talk about mask mandates and other things like that, but it's, we run into a lot of roadblocks in terms of moving those things forward. But I mean, I really have a lot of respect for the work that schools are doing these days. And it just seems like such a difficult situation to be in. I really appreciate what you all going through. So I mostly wanna hear what you folks have to say in terms of this evening, but in terms of the pension debate, we're moving forward on that. In terms of trying to make it possible for towns to function adequately, town municipal bodies to function adequately and remotely, we're working on that. And we're look, we'd be open to ways to try to make it easier for schools to operate as well. But I look forward to the conversation. Great, thank you, Senator. Um, let's open it to uh, the board with other questions or comments or responses. Um, I have a little other question. Yep. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Andrew Stein here. Uh, my question pertains to the waiting study because that was re referenced several times. And then, well, not just the waiting study, but uh, the, the school equity funding proposals that are on the table, because at this point we had this waiting study and then we had this task force and there's several different proposals on the table. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to, um, and you don't have to answer this now, but I think it would be helpful to school boards, not just our school board, to have an understanding of the different proposals that are out there. And in the past, um, the joint fiscal office, Mark Peralt would, every once in a while when there was a big education funding proposal would, I think it was through the VSBA, if I'm not mistaken, would provide school boards with an overview of a situation where it was very balanced. Like these are the, these are the different uh, options that are on the table and this is how it would impact you. And sometimes this might be after the fact, it might be here's what was decided during the legislative session and this is how it impacts you. And this happened at least a couple times that I can remember. And I feel like something of that nature would be really helpful to school boards to navigate this because we don't have the resources at our disposal necessarily to understand all of the different options that are out there. Or if there is a resource and you can direct us to it, that would be helpful. Okay. I see Representative Hooper and Senator Kirchlich have their hands up. Representative uh, Hooper? Representative Hooper, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. I, I remember when Mark did that presentation at, at, at what was then the Montpelier School Board, and I think he may have done it partly because he was then a resident of Montpelier, and it was kind of uh, uh, in doing his civic duty. Um, I, I can certainly take the request back to JFO, but what I have to say is on the finance side of things, which is Anne's side of the, of the ledger, they are down two staff people. We're really sad because Mark chose to retire and he was, he was the rock star of this issue. Yes. Um, so it may be hard for JFO to provide that, but I hear you and we can, we can have a chat about how to provide that information, information out that, to help, help districts with these questions. Uh, Senator Persick, wait. Yeah, and I, I don't know if folks have, have read the report. The recommendation of the task force does just lay out, there's really two options to two different ways of funding it. And in the back of the report, there are tables where you could look up your school district and see how the different, the two proposals would impact based on past year's funding. So there's lots of caveats in there, but it gives you an idea of the tax impact. And it would be uh, a tax increase for the Montpelier Roxbury district, either way, either proposal that you go, but to, to understand how that is, I, I totally agree. And Brad James could maybe do it, but I'm sure mm -hmm. Brad doesn't want to go around to all, you know, all the schools around the state. So maybe we, we should talk about how the best way to, to give that resource, because I'm sure it would be great to have somebody that could that understand school finances and how school boards put together their budgets to, to walk you through 
the impacts in, in the charts. And, and if you do want to look at those charts, definitely look it on your computer because the printout is like tiny. And even on the computer, it's kind of hard to blow up. So uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to like provide some Excel spreadsheets that you could look at and, and compare the different options. But that's kind of the work that we're in Senator Cummings committee mainly is going to be going through to, to try to figure out what the impacts will be. And, right. And I actually thought this would start in the House because you have two representatives in the House and they represent you. It's starting in the Senate. And in the Senate, everybody has schools that are winners and losers. So uh, in general, um, so we're starting. And again, we're going to not look at those individual spreadsheets until the end. We're going to have a look at everything that the task force did, um, you know, in, in recommendations. They've changed the weights. They've put more weights in. There's a, a weight now for middle school where it used to just be high school. Now they've put middle school in. Uh, there's weights for ruralness, um, probably won't hit Montpelier, but Roxbury definitely will be impacted by how rural they are. Um, we're going to look at all of it and we're going to see if we can, you know, come up with a, a, a plan. Uh, this week we had Brad James go through and explain how the weights work now. Uh, the weights have been there since the foundation formula. I do, I've never looked at them. I don't know that anyone has. They just were. And school boards accepted them, and they were. And this is the first really heavy lift we've had. So we're, we're starting at ground zero. It was enlightening. Uh, and humbling to watch Brad James walk us through how weights now can cancel each other out. Um, so we're going to be working through that. Uh, then we'll do the runs. And um, after we make a decision, it's going to go to the House. Um, and they're going to be, I'm sure, much more focused on the impact locally. But we're going to and then we're going to do a transition in so that there won't be any, you know, one year huge impact. And this all interplays its taxation um, with tax rates and the, the common level of appraisal and your grand lists. And so much is changing right now. We're trying to get a handle on it before making any commitments. Um, my commitment is to make sure you're adequately funded um, long run. Um, and I'm concerned about I didn't see anything in the governor's budget either about how we're going to come out of this pandemic and be, you know, with exhausted teachers, exhausted, you know, management, exhausted school employees, and exhausted and discouraged children. I have a grandson who was in kindergarten when this started. He's not in Montpelier, but he is in Vermont. Um, he's now halfway through second grade, and he's got six months of any continuous school experience under his belt. He was quarantined for five weeks this fall, and he's discouraged. Um, and he is not alone. And we're going to have to we're going to have to sink some money and some resources into that. And we know we have a mental health system that is imploding, was before this, and it's worse now. Um, we, you know, when we say anything, we're told, well, you have ESSER funds, but you have those and we don't know what they are or where they're being spent uh, across the state. So, that's going to be a challenge. And as Mary said, Mark Peralt retired 
Uh, we've got two new people and the long time, maybe six years, seven years of, uh, I don't think Graham's been with us that much, who's been doing our revenue forecasting, is trying to pick up the slack in the property, uh, the education fund forecasting. So, um, and then COVID has hit. So um, we're, we're limping along, I think, like all of you. Um, and we're, we're just trying to do the best, but there are a lot of parts and we're all under-resourced. Uh, remote legislating, I'll have to see how Mary likes combination legislating. <laughs> Other than there was a lot of feedback in joint meetings today. Um, but it's, it is more difficult. Um, and just stay in touch as you hear things, check them out with us, uh, email me, I'll run it down, uh, email any of us and we'll do what we can to, to run the questions down. But right now, I'm, I'm in kindergarten and just start, start learning about this whole system that's been there forever. And then once we figure out the present system, then we have to start figuring out where we're going to go from here. Um, so that's all I can tell you at this point. Wonder or Rhett, I'm not sure who you had up first, but. Sure. Um, one thing that you could do is waive five days from the mandatory 70, 175 day school year. Uh, last week, um, Ro Roxbury Village School was closed. We didn't have enough staff to run it safely. The following day, the entire district closed because there wasn't enough staff to take, to take right. care of our kids. Um, that could happen at any time. Every day, there are teachers in the classroom next door covering for somebody who's missing creating a lack of continuity in education for our kids and uh, outrageous experiences for our teachers where we're losing staff uh, in it, it, it. We're having a hard time with staffing. I'm just going to speak on behalf of Libby there. That's all I can say about that. Um, the other piece that I want to speak to, Act 46 requires that towns um, behave in the exact same way. And what that means is that a extreme minority in Roxbury can stop the will of Montpelier voters. Montpelier voters want to give the rights of non-citizens to vote. They passed that legislation. It was approved by the, the legislature. Roxbury it no. has not go, gone before Roxbury. It's anti-democratic, basically. You're ha you're, you have a, a town that's voting. The will of, the, of Montpelierites is being essentially vetoed by an extreme minority in Roxbury. And I really want our towns to get along. We're very different. Um, and not being able to respect the will of either town uh, doesn't help us develop the kind of relationships that are going to help us provide the best opportunities for our kids. Um, those are my points. Oops, I'm going to take my yeah. Do you, do you want to give the judge a response to Rhett? And sure. Then it's like, um, Senator Perks, I'm just going to go across the screen. I don't know who put their, their hand up first. Yeah, on the, and maybe Anthony might have some on the citizen voting because they worked on that bill in his committee, but you, you might have to pass a new a new charter or something. But uh, but I hear you on, on that issue. On the, on the 175 days in the education committee, we've had Secretary French in a couple of times. We've talked to him about this. He, he, he's reluctant to just automatically just switch it to 170, 165 days for all schools across the board, but he seemed very open to waiving those days that were closed when there's just not enough staff. He made it seem like that's a no brainer. Those, those days you won't have to make up. Um, so we we've been pressuring them a little bit, but there's there's you know it gets complicated to just passing a bill that has to go through the whole process and to the governor and everything like that. So we're trying to put enough pressure on them so that schools that really had to close for the reasons that you gave that those are 
are days that you don't have to make up. And I, I really hope that would be the, the, the case, but we have been talking about that. That's a real issue around the state. Uh, Representative Cooper? Yeah, I'll, I'll certainly bring the message back about um, the, uh, the issue around the number of days to our House Education Committee. I raised my hand on the non-citizen voting. Uh, to be clear, the charter change in Montpelier was only for the municipal side of elections. It was not for the school board precisely because of the issue of it um, going across two towns. And obviously Roxbury didn't ask to have its charter amended and the- Doesn't have a charter. State House would not impose that sort of charter change on Roxbury. Um, so the, on school issues, there never has been an opportunity for non-citizens to vote, sadly. I mean, I'm a huge supporter of it, but it, it's a moot question unless both entities ask for the right to for that for non-citizens. Yeah, just following up on that, and I'll let it go. Where it has been an issue, and I know John Odom is, is frustrated about this, is with mailing of ballots that, um, you know, Montpelier would like to mail ballots to all voters, and Roxbury does not want to do that because they want to. I, I think part of it is they have a healthy town meeting, smaller town. Um, they don't want to either create confusion around that or discourage participation. So, my understanding is Roxbury's, um, I guess now refusal, they, they, they denied it, right? Yeah. yeah, refusal to mail ballots means that ballots cannot be mailed in Montpelier either. So that that is a, an area where mm. there has been a real effect. So I, I'm a little confused by that and I'll talk with John. Yeah. Um, he has to carry a separate list for non-citizen voters well, yeah. anyway. No. It's not non-citizen, it's all voters. It's, okay. it's mailing ballots okay. to all voters. So yeah. you're not, so we're not talking about non-citizens now. Yeah, okay. we're talking about mailing Got ballots, it. you know. Well, so I thought the language, and maybe Anthony can jump in on, uh, Anthony or maybe, yeah, Anthony on sure. this. Yeah. I thought what we passed in terms of voting allowed for ballots to be commingled. So. Roxbury can do their thing, Montpelier can do their thing, and then we just count them together. Well, in order to do a mail out, mail out or mail in ballots, whichever you want to call it, um, in a unified in a union in, in a union district, all the communities have to agree to do it, or else it can't happen. Yeah. So, if you got Montpelier and Roxbury acting as a unit, as a as a unified district, then both of the communities would have to agree to do it. The select boards of both communities would have to agree to allow it to happen first before it could happen. So it is unfortunate. And I think for Montpelier, it's very frustrating because they put a lot of effort into doing mail-in ballots or mail-out ballots. I always forget which way to call it. But the law says that both community or all the communities involved have to agree to do it. Otherwise, it can't happen. So it is unfortunate. But that's what the law says. No, we can't change and with And with non-citizen voting, Mary's right. I think Mary said this. Uh, oh, maybe, maybe it was Anne. But non-citizen voting only relates to town or city issues, not not school issues. Yeah, Schools yeah, are considered a separate municipality. And just really quickly on the commingling, it's an issue with the career center vote of all the towns that are voting on that. They, you'd have to get all six towns, I think it is, or eight towns, the to school boards to vote to not commingle. So those will have to be not mailed and and all brought to Barry. Right. Thank you. Uh, Amanda. Well, there's anything you can do about it. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Amanda. I want to go back to the pupil waiting study. And um, as a board, we haven't actually talked about it or decide or like how do we support or not support. So individual as a school board, as, as someone who really supports equity and justice for English language learners. And as someone who was an English language learner myself, continue to be, um, I, I read the Colby study uh, that, that, she, that was submitted 
about moving forward with a hybrid model for ELL students. And I, you know, I, I really encourage you to really push forward for that because I think it's really is necessary. As a Montpelier resident who uh, really is part of a community that is trying to move forward of bringing refugees to our town to increase our diversity and support our mm -hmm. refugee population, I think it's really, really important that we're putting our, you know, um, talk and move, moving forward with thinking about um, our refugee community and our future immigrants for our cities and towns. And I think um, also just, you know, Senator, uh, when I hear you talk about losers and, and winners, you know, I really want to encourage for us to think about, you know, what that looks like in equity. It's not like it's, it's, a, it's about moving things around and it's, it's not about who's losing or, or, who's, or, or who's winning, but it's about fairness and justice and how we really become an equity Vermont that we, that, that we wanna be. So I think um, I, I really just think about the redistribution of resources as you know, a justice issue uh, and, I, and I think, you know, everybody has talked about it. And I think it's, it's time to move forward and to be creative and transformative and not think of losers or winners, but think of like our students who are, who is the center of our world in this, in this district. So I, I just wanted to say that. Uh, Senator Cummings, do you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, the reason we aren't and the reason the summer task force did not regularly look at the printouts was that as they worked through and as we worked through the guiding force should not be who's a winner and who's a loser and if one of my schools is losing we have to change things the guiding principle has been equity um, how do we adequately fund the schools that are bearing the burden of um, the extra cost of educating certain groups of students? The English is second language, and I'm remembering this, um, the, the, what, the, one of the chairs, one of the co-chairs of the task force uh, is on my committee, and she is very articulate, Senator Hardy. Um, their recommendation, the recommendation of the task force was that English language learners um, tend to be concentrated in a few schools and uh, they're trying to find a way to adequately fund those schools. Um, and as we're trying to bring refugees and we're right now refugees have has traditionally been more focused in the Chittenden County area. We've had some, I know that um, one of many years ago, uh, Barry and Montpelier were a site. Uh, Rutland is now a site. We wanna make sure that the finances are there to adequately help those students learn a new language so that they can adjust and feel comfortable in a new culture. And one of the concerns through all of this, the reason we do the waiting is to get the extra services for the students. And ELL, that's especially important. The concern is that um, if you just get more money, you there's no strings attached and schools have the option of um, just reducing their tax rates or buying new band uniforms. There's no control over that. So part of, I think, what we're looking at is, um, and I know Senator Brock, who was on the task force and is also on my committee and a former auditor, um, has a uh, put in a um, evaluation so that we know that when we put this money in, that students are in fact getting a benefit. Uh, that, you know, that English language learners do, you know, until you learn the language and it's amazing how quickly 
especially younger children, pick up a language. Um, until you learn that, you, you, you really can't do a whole lot else um, unless you have a translator walking around, you know, at your elbow. So that's primary. That's before you can even start education, you've got to start getting a grasp of the language. And um, we're going to do it uh, based on equity. That's, that's just the driving force right now. That was the force that brought about the original study and the task force is how do we make this system equitable for students and for the schools that are educating them? Thank you, Senator Cummings. Um, Mia? I also wanted to note, it looked like maybe a member of the public offered a question. I don't know if we wanted to take any of those or I couldn't read what the whole question was, but I just in the chat, I in saw the that. chat yeah, it popped up. I'll, I will take a look. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, I had a couple, I have a couple of questions. Um, I was glad to hear an acknowledgement that we are in a mental health crisis right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to know, because it is clear that our schools are carrying a lot of that burden and shouldn't be. I'm curious to know what resources you all know about or have seen in the governor's budget. Maybe I apologize, I have not caught up on that myself um, for the mental health system and, and filling gaps in the mental health system uh, statewide and not relying on our schools to be um, caring for the mental health of our students and staff. Uh, Representative Hooper. Um, so in the budget adjustment, which passed out of my committee uh, last week and is going to be on the floor of the House tomorrow, uh, we significantly added to the governor's, to the current fiscal year budget, resources for designated agencies who are you know, one of the key pro providers of mental health services broadly in our communities. We um, significantly did work on that. Um, I, honestly, I doubt if it was enough, but, but we, we made a difference over what the governor had proposed. Um, and, um, we did not look into the Success Beyond Six grants for the current fiscal year, but as I mentioned, I, I think we need to be doing that. Um, I'm just, I, I, I bet they're level-ish funded and I suspect they need to be significantly increased. What, so I'm planning on looking at that. The governor's the proposal for FY23 um, looked at expanding slightly the mobile uh, crisis response that is being done in Rutland um, that is focused on, on responding to children um, in particular, but it, it's very limited. It's just moving it to a handful of other communities. So um, we need to do more. And I would love to know more. I, I agree that this shouldn't be a responsibility of the school, but we also know that delivery of healthcare services, you know, sometimes works best or, or our schools see the needs. And you know, so if you have ideas for what we should be doing, um, talk, talk to us, tell us, tell us what it looks like rather than, yeah, I, I would love to know what your thoughts are. I said the, I just wanted to comment on the, the comment in the chat, which is actually something I wanted to, to raise as well. Um, in terms of, of the surplus, uh, I definitely agree with the sentiments that have been expressed that uh, not only kind of ensuring that we've got funds for a rainy day, but also the investment, the, the investment opportunity in our infrastructure, in our schools that that might present. 
Um, you know, what can we do to to kind of you know give support for the legislature to not rebate that? Because I'm sure there will be a lot of people who would appreciate a rebate. Uh, and I, I don't want to minimize you know, the, the tax burden that, that many folks have, but this is you know, an investment opportunity. Um, and also, I just would love to both you know, plan an idea and, and, and get your thoughts on um, investment. You know, a lot of our students have come to us talking about, uh, obviously, they're very concerned about climate change, um, and they should be. Uh, and uh, you know, one thing that, that a lot of students are very interested in doing, and I think a lot of board members share this desire, is to uh, make our schools part of, part of the solution and, and to be carbon neutral. Um, are there some investment opportunities to uh, invest in things like, like heating systems and, and buses uh, to get either lower, lower or no carbon uh, solutions in both school transportation and, and school heating? Um, I can answer that last one, the last point, and a couple make a couple other quick comments. But there, I'm working on a renewable energy grant program for schools heating specifically. We passed the language last year. Appropriations kind of said, well, we'll keep the language in there, but we'll take the money because there's going to be a whole bunch of climate money with ARPA next year. I think it is ARPA eligible, something I've been working on over the summer. And so I think there will definitely be opportunities there. Um, heating the Montpelier school is tricky. I mean, it was, there's the whole district heating issue that happened, but I, I think there will be money there and for just for, for the heating system, but also for the electric buses and transportation, there's a, there's a bunch of money for buses, but also for charging stations and things like that. And the, and the school as a workplace so that teachers that drive electric cars can, can plug them in while they're there. So definitely working on, on those things. And then the, on the funding, I mean, you don't have to, I mean, you might have to convince the governor so he doesn't veto it, but, you know, Mary and Ann and their committees, they can, they can, you know, work on how that surplus is, is dealt with. And I, one of the issues that we talked about in the task force is on the waiting task force is that some of these changes will be quite dramatic for some districts and some of that surplus could be used as part of the way to feather those in. You know, in addition to over time, this is an opportunity to do this equity work, but make it not so much of a big hit to, to some of these taxpayers. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Cummings? And yeah, I, you know, the governor did his address and he told people they're all going to get a rebate and we're going to lower your tax rates. And he's told people they're going to get, um, you know, uh, a couple of groups like nurses and childcare workers were going to give you a tax credit. Uh, but there's nothing in there that I've seen about tax credits for mental health workers. And we have as crying a need for that as anything. Um, he's asked us to do a rebate, but there's no details. Um, is it going to be income based? Is it going to be uh, everybody? How he's saying half, but no fleshing out of that. The other half of the surplus he wants to use for technical education and beefing that up. But again, there's no details and the finance committee doesn't know anything about technical education. So I'm dumping that back to education. Um, and again, I can't see how we are going to get through the waiting study uh, without it impacting the education fund. We were very concerned uh, because we did see a $30 million increase in pension costs last year um, that the pension negotiations could really up it, but it looks like we've taken the worst of the hit in the ed fund on that. But waiting could be. And just because we're flush this year, there's a lot of needs 
Um, and a lot of it, you know, and, and it is, it's climate change. It's, we've got schools where the swamp next door is draining into the basement. Um, we are just starting doing radon testing in schools. Uh, we got off pretty cheaply doing lead testing, but radon could go either way. Um, and so we're, I don't think we're gonna make any commitments, at least I'm not until we get as many of the, we know as much as we possibly can about our present financial state and what, you know, what the, the future costs are going to be and what the implications are. Because it's easy to say, well, we're going to do a tax cut and make everybody feel good. And then next year we have to raise it. Um, and that's an ongoing battle in the end fund. Uh, we have that one every couple of years. Um, but it you need to be able to plan over the long term and make sure that schools don't see those big hits up or down. Uh, we've worked to try and level that so that you can operate um, without a taxpayer revolt um, out there on you. Thank you. Uh, Rep. I, I just ask that you be loud in your support of reinvesting the money rather than rebating it or giving it back as taxes. And if you could get the school board association to be equally loud, I think that will be very helpful. We try to listen hard to everybody, uh, but voices coming in saying no, reinvest it would be very helpful. Um, with regard to the climate issues, um, I, it, it, this is very important to me personally, and I'm looking for every way that I can to figure out how to make the investments that are gonna make a difference. We set aside um, in the budget adjustment $87 million so that we would be prepared to um, do the matching uh, that is necessary to draw down as many federal dollars as we can. And we're all also obviously looking at the ARPA dollars. So I, I'm looking for every opportunity we can to bring those resources to our communities on this mm -hmm. issue. I would also just add that while it's important to have the school districts raise their voices, the faculty and staff, it's really important and inspiring to allow the students to continue to be heard as well. And, you know, it's one thing, as, as Mary and Anne has said, it's one thing, to, it's hard to fight against a little tax cut because people feel good about it. But a little tax cut doesn't necessarily help you if you're then your schools are dilapidated in the long run. And having the schools be good examples of being climate neutral, being carbon neutral, and making the right kinds of investments will actually save more money down the road than people are going to get from this small tax cuts that he's talking about. So you just have to make sure that people hear your voices. And I appreciate the fact that students have really been speaking up lately. And I, I know that takes a lot of cooperation on the part of teachers and staff to allow that to happen. And I think that's really, really important. Um, did I see other hands? Yeah. 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 One of the things I was just gonna um, just wanted to plus one on the energy efficiency upgrades because that is in the top three of issues that we hear from our community. Um, I've only been on the board for a little over a year, but over and over and over, we have students showing up, we have um, member other members of the community showing up at board meetings, um, saying this is a priority for them. So just carrying their voices mm -hmm. on over to you. Just wanted to chime in on that one. Um, and then the other question I wanted to ask was about, um, uh, I can't remember who, maybe it was you representative who were asking about CTEs. We have a great partnership with the Central Vermont um, Career Center. And one thing that I did catch in the governor's, uh, I believe the state of the state was a real need to be investing in, um, in the trades. Mm -hmm. And this is a place, uh, this, this, this career center is a place where we could be doing that. It's it's on the cusp of real growth, I believe. They had to turn away almost half of the students that applied to go uh, because of space. And uh, as Senator Perchelik referenced earlier, 
we are now we're um, our town and the other 17 towns that send students there will be voting to make it its own district and it feels like a real chance to um, I don't know have sort of like a shining star of education and career development and career preparation for the young people um, for generations to come so I just wanted to I don't know exactly what, I mean, it's gonna take money to make that happen. And uh, it feels like a real win-win for both um, uh, what our state needs, uh, because we need people who can do these really technical, um, highly specific and very well-trained jobs. And we need to be able, clearly we need to be able to give the students this opportunity because they haven't, they had to turn away so many of them just this year. So uh, I guess that's just me making a pitch for it instead of really asking a question. But um, if there was the, that feels to me like the kind of facilities investment also, in addition to upgrading our buildings uh, that we need to be making. And it's a regional center. So senators, that's your constituents mm -hmm. want that all around the region. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hope, I, I'm supportive of it and really hope it, it does pass that, that new governor, governance structure. Great, Kristen? Hi, thanks, Jim. Hopefully everybody's going to be able to hear me. My, my uh, connection is a little unstable out here in Roxbury, so that's a vote for broadband. But um, I, yeah, I wanted to kind of tie a couple things together. Um, one, I just want to, you know, I, I appreciate the, um, you know, the things that you're all giving, but I really school board members to some degree were spectators, even though many people on our school board are cleaning bathrooms and classrooms. Um, you know, we have a board that is incredibly um, engaged and active and rolling up sleeves to really try to see our schools through. Uh, but I just really want to give it up to Libby Bonesteel, who has been an incredible, incredible, I mean, I, I couldn't think of really like a more fitting last name for Libby. <laughs> um, because even though, even though I will not say, I mean, this is not to undermine that, I, this has been so hard for her and all of our staff. And I think anything that you can continue to do to advocate for our schools and the reality that they're experiencing on a, on a daily basis that ranges anywhere from heartbreaking to exhausting to impossible um, to just convey that message um, to legislators and the governor and the agency of education. Um, I know Libby has, um, you know, there's the new test to stay rollout that's underway and um, testing kits coming out and it's a lot of change all at once and just giving some autonomy to the districts to decide how that rollout looks and how the distribution of tests looks would be incredibly helpful um, to our district and um, the highly qualified nursing staff um, and administrators in our buildings. Um, so yeah, that's one piece. Uh, I did have some questions. I know Senator Perchlick that you were on the Universal After School Task Force, I believe, which I'm not sure if that work is done. Um, I do, and I wanted to respond. I know um, Representative Hooper, you had asked a question just where this um, board is at in terms of after school programming, because it sounds like there is some funding that's coming through the governor's bu budget. Um, so I'm curious if those two things, I'm sure they're connected in terms of the, the work of the task force and the, and the money that's being put out there. But you know, when I think about, and full disclosure, I'm a parent that does, um, I'm a working parent who does uh, take advantage of after school programming and it's how I'm able to go to work. Um, and I think that's true for many families. And I think there's many, like there are definitely some families in our district I know that are not able to access after school programming um, because of capacity. Um, so I'm curious how that funding is gonna become available, what it's intended for. Well, our district does have after school programs in both towns, even though they operate somewhat differently. Um, you know, who is going to be eligible for that funding and, and how. Um, and then I would just also wonder, you know, after school programs can be really, really powerful settings for mental health services. Um, you know, a, a big role of after school programming is social, emotional, and behavioral supports of our students. And, and just, you know, encouraging some rethinking about how after school program funding could be extended towards really kind of bulking up mental health um, support opportunities, even though I know our resources are also thin in terms of just people. Um, 
And so, yeah, and I guess I would just say that all after school programs are not equal. And so if we have funding that is really going to invest in excellent staffing that can really play the role, the potential role that after school programs can fill, um, then we can be picking up some of some of the slack that not the slack, but just some of the hardship on the school day in terms of educational enrichment happening in after school, the mental health piece, um, and just and the wraparound services for families that sometimes it's just really hard for school day folks to extend. So um, clearly I'm an advocate for after school and I would just really love to hear um, the status of the funding and the universal after school task force. Thank you. Well, I can I can start on the, the task force did end its work. We issued our report, but we're going to have Holly Morehouse into the education committee to give us an update. Um, it's the one thing I'm, I'm sure there are other things, but well, I think I disagree with the governor on a lot of things. But one thing that I'm really in line with him on is universal after school funding. And it seems like something he's very genuine about. And I know uh, folks that work for the governor are really working hard to, to make that funding happen and working together with with uh, you know, after school of Vermont to make it happen. So I don't know that maybe Mary or Ann knows more of the details of the funding. I, I just know that he mentioned it. And I know I've talked to folks in the governor's office about that there's going to be money uh, on the task force. We talked about making sure that the money from the cannabis sales uh, is is continued to be earmarked for after school. So that's that's the kind of ongoing funding that we're going to need to have universal after school of the high quality that you talked about, which I totally agree with. And we're going to need something like that to really get to universal after school because we have this one time money. But as everybody talks about, they don't want to use one time money for ongoing programs. So a part of that cannabis money is something that we could use for the after school and the summer programs and the vacation days. And all the all the different things that these that these children need when their parents are working. So, I'm I'm continuing to work on it. Also, Senator Campion was on a prior were after school task force a few years ago. So he's also a big supporter of it. So it's something that the education committee is going to continue to work on. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have any details for you today. Uh, Senator Campion. Yeah, I I also have the cannabis bill. <laughs> And there's several proposals for how to spend the money. I have at least three cannabis bills. But when the base agreement went through is that, um, and I'm forgetting the percentage, money would go to prevention and um, after school was part of the prevention. But in the spirit of saying something as an idea um, and knowing that it frequently takes over a decade for an idea whose time has come, our whole we are struggling with an entire system that was set up when mothers were home to take care of children and children went to school when they were six and they came home at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they had days off and they came home when they were sick and they had the summers off. And that isn't so anymore. Um, we're dealing with childcare and we found out the stress in childcare is equal to the stress in schools, only the pay is worse. Um, we're, we're trying to find a way to socialize the fact that women are in the workforce, that children need someone to care for them, watch them, educate them while their parents are working. And that's preschool. I, I watch my daughters. One of my daughters is a vet tech. She drops her kids off at school at 730 in the morning because she has to be to work in the afternoon. Those same grandchildren go to day camp in Montpelier, fortunately, but it gets out at 430 and their parents don't get out of work until five o'clock. So their grandfather and I pick them up and they come to our house until their parents are free. Not everyone has grandparents that can pick kids up. Um, and we've got all these different schedules and 
we're going to have to because uh, we're going to have to find a way. Our, our children who are our future need that. And we are working. Um, and a lot of it comes down to money. I think we know what needs to be done, but finding a way to socialize that cost. And I think businesses learned during the pandemic that yes, childcare is very important because their workers can't work if their kids keep getting sent home from school because they've been exposed or, you know, they're, the, your workers are afraid to, uh, you know, it, it, childcare has been an essential and school has been an essential. And having some place for those kids to go after school is essential. And hopefully, as we come out of this, we'll be able to have a talk with the business community, with society as a whole, as to how do we socialize the cost of caring for our children because we all benefit from it. Um, but it's challenging, but it's all there. It's all, it's all one piece right up through post-secondary education or training or, you know, whatever we're calling it. Um, I want to acknowledge we're a little over time and I promised you an hour, so I don't want to keep up very, very full of time. Do you have time for, I think Amada has one more question and then we can uh, can thank you and go. Or, and and if, you're, if you need to go now, that's, that's okay too, but Amanda? Yeah, I, just, I know that um, we have a lot of families concerned about our special education. And I wanna, you know, just see how, what you're thinking about that and um, how you're putting money into the needs of our special ed, our newer diverse kids, our kids with disabilities um, that are in, you know, disproportionately impacted by the pandemic um, and all that is happening. So I know that we, our families have concerns about their students. Um, and yeah, I wanted to know how much effort and money you're putting to increase our special education funding and support for our families and for our teachers and our schools and our district. Well, one thing I can say on that is that on the waiting task force and then on Dr. Colby's study, they, they talked about the funding that's needed for special education and, and didn't recommend a, a different weight, although that's a, that's a potential option. Um, but it was clear that the changes of Act 173, which would change it to a census block grant, are gonna have an impact on that. And sort of like the weights, it could, depending on which special education students you have which year, it could, provide more funding or it could provide less. And so it's definitely, as far as from my perspective, if we have to make sure that the Act 173 changes happen together with the weights because it's it's gonna impact, they're gonna be interconnected, all these things. And you need to know kind of how much, you know, what your budget is with the pupils that you have, whether they have special needs. We also talked about having a special grant for those um, students that are experiencing trauma, because that was something else that Dr. Colby identified in her original report, is that if you're talking about additional funding that gets some students up to, to performing at the same level as others, those that have experienced trauma definitely need more services. And didn't recommend a wait for that either, but recommended that we look at trying to find some kind of like categorical grant for that. So that's something else that we're going to look at in education. But I hear you, Amanda, and I'm also willing to talk to you and more about the English language learners and, and want to make sure that I, maybe you come into the committee and talk about it as well. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you again. We This was a fantastic conversation. We really appreciate your time and, and your willingness to go a little over time. Uh, we look forward to continuing to um, communicate throughout the session and uh, working with you to uh, both improve our, our schools and, and do good by our students and uh, get us out of the, the current um, pandemic uh, stronger than, than we came into it. So uh, thank you again. We really, really appreciated the time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Paul, thank you very all much. the school people that are working so hard. Uh,
It's mm -hmm. amazing. Like Representative Hooper dropped something into the chat that she wanted us to, if, if someone could just read oh. it out loud so we can all know oh, what she said. Sorry. Just says I have no details on the governor's proposal. Okay, okay great. <laughs> very helpful. <laughs> Okay. Thank you again. Good night. Right. Thank you. Good night. you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so next on the agenda is a facilities committee update, and I'm not sure. We have an next. We have nothing to update. <laughs> update on. No. Okay. That's... I can update on that. Right. Yeah. Um. Do the facilities committee still around? Like I look at the Department of Taxes because I'm used to saying that in front of these people all the time. <laughs> um. Kristen did. Um try to get us back together. We did have a plan um, in the fall that we thought it'd be great to visit the school buildings to sort of remind us the context of the conversations about the facilities. Yep. Um, and so I do think we'd still like to do that. I think that has gotten um, rightly derailed by just the literal demand on staff time. Yes, that absolutely. In that. Um, so I think we talked about uh, setting up some dates in the coming months and possibly having um, maybe in-person tours when it seems safe to do so in each of the buildings before board meetings. Try to do maybe one per board meeting, something like that. Yeah, no, that I, I think that's a great idea. And I know, um, I mean, I certainly did one when I was early on the board. It was, it was very helpful. Um, that was, those were different times, but I think when, when the staff feels comfortable doing it, we should, we should definitely do it. It's, it's really good to see the, even things like just seeing the heating systems and, um, yeah, how to seeing the board the through board. Andrew's eyes or yes, seeing the, the buildings school. through Andrew's eyes is a completely different experience than you just walking through the hallways. Yeah, I believe mean, it. Excellent. Uh, um, really, really briefly, too, on, on this issue with regard to net zero um, initiatives, the city audit did come out, it was published. I did send that around months ago. I don't know if I sent it to everyone on the board, but I think I sent it to the facilities committee. And I do think that's something that when the facilities committee next meet next meets should review and discuss and talk with Andrew about general implications. It was at a very high level, um, but I think it would still be helpful. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so we need to you approve a budget. Um, small little item. Grant, you want to give us any any updates, and then uh, we can can give you what you need. Thanks for hanging in there. Yeah, no problem. Yes, thank you. No problem. It was an interesting conversation to overhear. Um, so tonight is uh, you, the briefing that I sent out is a obviously a shortened version that's focused on changes and even. That um, I'm still going to slide a uh, skim over most slides just because there's not a whole lot you need to be updated on, fortunately. Um, for anybody who's calling in that wants more information, just a reminder the January 5th briefing was very, uh, very comprehensive, had a lot more information. That is posted on the board's website. So if you want to dig in a little deeper and you didn't see that last presentation, you can go to the January 5th briefing. For tonight, though, I was just hoping, uh, can you yeah, I'm share sorry. the slides? Um, tonight, I'm just going to skip to the fourth slide that you received that says changes. And while Libby's trying to get that up, I'm just going to go ahead and start talking about it. The only real significant change in the budget is that we received a final, final in air quotes, um, equalized pupil count. And fortunately, it's almost 15 kids higher than the last presentation that I showed you. So that's good. Um, the, we were expecting it to be, um, I think we had plugged in 10 more kids for English language learners that, weren't, that were missing. We got exactly those 10 kids, but we also got a bump for uh, free and reduced uh, lunch waiting, which was a little more than I anticipated. And to tell you the truth, much like last year, when I try to do the math to recreate that, I'm not getting the same answer, but it's a good number. So I guess I won't push too hard. Um, so that equalized pupil count, that's almost 15 kids higher. What that does is it drops our spending per pupil about $215, which also drops our tax rates 
in both communities, it's around two cents. So that's good. Um, if we can skip all the way, Libby, to I think slide, might as well go to slide eight, the tax rates. You can look through these at your leisure, but um, keep going. There we go. So the residential tax rates on page eight. Um, the equalized pupils about halfway down, you can see that number 1248.74. That's the new number that changed, which obviously drops your spending per pupil. You'll still see the dollar yield is highlighted because as you remember, there were kind of two different um, scenarios. We are using the more uh, conservative number, which has been recommended by the AOE that everybody use the more conservative number. Um, so the very bottom line, the residential tax rate with CLA, that number is obviously a little different than the last time we got together. Um, Montpelier's is about two or 2.1 cents lower than it was. And Roxbury is about like 1.7 or 1.8 cents lower than it was. So just to kind of review the bidding, from FY22's budget to FY23's budget, Montpelier's tax rate is about 4.8 cents lower. Roxbury's tax rate is about 1.6 cents higher. So next slide, please. The next slide shows those residential tax rate impacts for every um, $100,000 worth of property value. So you can see uh, in Montpelier, it'd be $48 less for $100,000 in property and Roxbury $16 more for every 100,000. And as the note says, we don't have a final dollar yield that won't come out until after town meeting day. So these aren't final, final numbers, but this is pretty good. These are pretty good numbers for us. Um, can you skip, actually, I, I think like maybe two or three more slides to like the summary, one more. So the, the budget summary, just as a reminder, you know, we did get that influx of federal funds. Um, we did have that dollar yield, which is significantly higher than it has ever been. Um, so those things did allow us to add a lot of resources, which was awesome for us, awesome for the kids. And what's awesome for the taxpayers is it didn't create a huge burden to taxpayers. So the total budget increase four and a half percent that's pretty that's a pretty big number for us it's usually around three and a half to four percent so it's a little bigger than usual um but because of additional federal funds the ed increase in ed spending was only four percent which is more kind of typical for us um the increase in spending per pupil is a little higher because we had a drop in pupils but that dollar yield increase really bailed us out so the bottom line Montpelier's tax rates going down 4.8 cents, which is 2.7% uh, reduction. Roxbury's up 1.6 cents, but that is only a 1.1% increase. So I think that's very reasonable. Um, next, please. Just a reminder for everybody out there that our ARP ESSER public plan is out there. There's a link there. Um, and then the final slide I have is just to open it up for you. If there are any questions that you have before you approve the budget and approve the warning, and those are the two things you really need to do today is approve the budget um, and then approve the warning and authorize Jim to sign that warning. I was asked, a, I was asked a question this past week by uh, another board member, and I couldn't remember I was asked if the per pupil spending number, if our equalized pupil number was uh, was final, and I could I remembered at some point in recent years it changed late in the game. We got some additional information. Does it some has it changed in the past five years? Has it changed after this point when we voted? I, it may have last year. Yeah, and I think yeah. last year was the only year that in my 16 years that it came out that late. And okay. I think a lot of that was because of data problems with student information systems okay. and how they fit in. Okay. I believe the number that we have right now is the final number that we're going to get. Okay. Um, the occasionally what will happen is a, a district will find an error and and so the AOE will just adjust that one district and they won't 
harm anybody else because it's so late. So I think this is our final number. It's a little lower than last year, but it's luckily a little higher than I thought it was going to be. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Just looking a little further ahead, um, like to next year, not, I guess, not necessarily for this year, but um, the equalized pupil did that do you do you think that that went down more because we cleaned up our data this year or do you think that that is a more of a trend because it's we also have some declining enrollment or I, well i think is uh, it all a guessing game? i think well, there's <laughs> yeah. there's two factors that i would say before grant jumps in is that our pre-k population or kids who are enrolled in our pre-k is considerably less than what it typically has been in the past i see and our uh, kindergarten is considerably lower. Now, remember, neither of those two things are mandatory. Right. So there could very well be families out there. I don't know. I have no way of knowing. Right. That are holding their kids out of kindergarten in particular mm -hmm. um, until next year. Yeah. And I'd say, I think our number is down like maybe 11 or 12 from last year. Right. About six of that is just because the overall statewide equalizing ratio that everybody gets hit with dropped us by six kids right there yeah so over half of our decrease was because of an equalizing ratio statewide that's a little lower than it was last year and that's not related to us having cleaner data it, it is not okay. it's related okay. to just the actual number of kids versus the weighting how the weighting artificially increases and so there's it looks like there's more kids than there really are uh -huh. and so they bring everybody down yeah so everybody gets okay. hit with like a 95 percent factor um, and last year, that factor was a little higher statewide. So that is over half of it. And then about four kids, I think, is probably just pre-K by itself. Because um, we were up to about 130 um, between in-house and, and private. And I think we're down to maybe 80 or Yeah, something. it's really low. Okay. It's very low. Um, okay. But overall, I think it was FY21, we hit our high water mark, I think, for for um, kindergarten through 12. And um, I don't think we're gonna drastically drop, but we are gonna be fairly stable and maybe slightly declining. So it is something to think about. I think the waiting study is, is a little more concerning how that waiting factor might impact us. And I was glad to hear the legislators talk about transitioning to right. it. Because I think if that all happened in one year, it would it would be devastating for tax rates. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that they're talking already about transitioning. Okay, thanks, Grant. Okay. Other questions? All right. Two, first one, has it been historically acceptable to refer to people from a failure as Methuselahites? Rockstarian <laughs> people as Rockstarians? Rockstarians. <laughs> I think you're going to have to go to the historical society for that one. Yeah. I kind of like Roxbarians, though. Yeah. Kind of like Rotarian. Well, Fillerites definitely has, has some history behind it. Roxbarians is new to me, but if, if we want to do it, <laughs> if you're good with it, yeah. we're good. Okay, just just making sure. That I think it's good. official right now. Just yeah. Yeah. Saying. Yeah. that's great. Um, so I know that the common level appraisal in Roxbury is essentially causing us to pay higher tax rate with regard to the school budget. And I don't understand, and this could go to anyone and it could be, and I could maybe use some support outside of this meeting. I'm going to want to speak to that in our town meeting um, and sort of explain how Roxbury doesn't get hit with a tax increase based on the common level of appraisal. Yeah. I mean, it's 11.8% negative impact, meaning we would pay 11.8 .8 cents negative impact, meaning we would pay one more. more. So I think for Slide me, eight. the important piece to put in perspective for folks is that it was the overall actual tax burden, like the literal dollar amount that's on the property tax bill is still far lower. The CLA in Montpelier is at 80%, which is like, they're, that's pretty bad. And the property values in Roxbury have been going up and down. And there's such a small number of sales per year that it's a lot more volatile. But I think it's, I, for me, it's helpful to look at the actual literal 
property tax bill on the same value is still lower. It's not that there's this. this okay. And if we can go back one more slide, please. Yeah. So yeah, on this slide, you can see um, it's yeah, look, the CLA is right. And, and the drop between 22 and 23 for Roxbury is dramatic compared to um, Montpelier. So even though Montpelier is seeing a, a drop in the tax rate and Roxbury is seeing an increase, it's still a much lower tax rate overall. Um, yeah. And I think if you look at the trend that, that one slide, that line graph, you can see that Roxbury is way better off than the world. Just absorbed in the volume of Montpelier tax rate, essentially. Is that kind of how it mm -hmm. plays out? No. Can you go back to that slide again, number eight? Can I? I'm going to just try. Uh, yeah. uh, so we can do this another time. Like, I, have no I have no this problem is, doing this. this. No, no. This is helpful for yeah. Roxbury residents, too. So before. So before the CLA is applied, this is the tax rate. It's the same for both municipalities. So in FY22, it was a dollar and 49 cents or 498. And then in FY23, it drops to 1.394. But the CLA is the thing that gets applied last. And so this number, this tax rate gets divided by that CLA. So the higher the CLA is, the lesser the dollar rate is going to be right. You divide something by four, you know, one fourth is less than one half, right? Um, same thing here. So the the base tax rate is lesser this year, but because Roxbury's CLA dropped six or eight percent, that is having a big impact in driving your tax rate up there. Yeah, I mean that's the part. I know that the. The values have gone up a lot. There's been a lot of change. And, and that has nothing to do with much. Change. No, well, like, no, but I mean, I just, I'm trying to think of how the conversation is framed. Because property values sold, sold at higher rates, yeah. Roxbury's taxes were adjusted up to reflect right. the higher. But it, but it didn't hurt if we only pay 1.1% more. Like, that's the part that I want to. It's get, get my head around the details a little better because I want to, because this is great. This is amazing for Roxbury considering the changes that we've seen. And I want to be able to speak to that when, when the time comes before, before the town, at the time we would to anyone, especially in the visioning process. All of this, I want to understand as well as I can so that I can convey how important it is that this is where we are. I would say for both communities, the thing that saved us this year saved a lot of people, and that is the high dollar yield, which is a statewide factor that gets compared to our spending. That dollar yield helped both communities out dramatically. It it looks like Montpelier uh, is is better off than Roxbury as far as looking at twenty two to twenty three, but both communities benefited by the dollar yield. And then the fact that Montpelier CLA didn't drop as dramatically made them actually have a better tax rate compared to last year, whereas Montpelier's drop or Roxbury's drop was a little more significant. But still, because so of that time. dollar yield yeah. going up so much, it really absorbed most of that. Okay. So I think next year it'll be very interesting because both communities are reappraising. So I'm wondering, theoretically, you would hope that both communities would have a CLA that's pretty close to 100% next year. So it'll be neat because the, the equalized... Oh, Grant would say that. Grant and Jill would say that. It's a little <laughs> nerdy to say that. <laughs> Only Grant the equalized rate, uh, residential tax rate, which Andrew was pointing out before CLA, is the same for both communities. If the, if the reappraisal comes out and both communities are around 100%, then the actual tax rate would be very similar as well. Yeah, and, and it won't be as confusing. And, 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 and explain it all going forward because I'll be able to refer back to that. And, and one more way to think about this is that that equalized tax rate dropped 7% from last fiscal year to this fiscal year, but the common level of appraisal for Roxbury dropped about 8%. So that drop in the CLA of 8% was greater than the drop in the base tax rate of 7%.
and that offsets it. That's why it goes up a little bit for Roxbury, whereas for Montpelier, it drops, the CLA drops 4%, which does not offset that 7% decrease in the base rate. So therefore, Montpelier realized the increase. Yeah. But it's, the CLA is based on it's it it's based on sales of properties yeah. in in the different municipalities. I will be better able to explain it just for this. Or maybe short for Andrew. Time. Yeah. For Grant, he <laughs> thinks it's I think, neat I to think talk Andrew about can it. So rents out his time for. I don't know about that. <laughs> I think the other thing, is, and as I've been telling these committees when I've been here talking about this, is that education spending has not exploded, right? So the education fund collects what the education fund needs to spend, and so the actual literal property tax bill is not jumping at the same rate as the CLAs. So it may, it, it's, it's just important to remember that, that, that if we, if our, if our budget had gone up a, a large amount and the CLA had dropped, then I could see some consternation, but these are all different factors that are meant to kind of balance it back out. So the actual demand from our district has not jumped the same way that the CLA has fluctuated. Um, any other comments or questions? Should we yeah. vote to approve a budget? I move to approve the FY23 school budget. I have a second. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 clarification question. Yes. The, uh, the SR3 is not. Yeah. yeah. I vote yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Aye. 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 Great. You know, I, I, before you said ESSER 3 is not included in the budget. There's a little bit, there's some for a couple of positions, okay. but just some. Position. It's like 300,000 out of a two point whatever okay. million. Right? Yeah. It's, this is not the ESSER 3 plan. Yes. And then do we do a second motion just on the yeah, warning? We'll for the warning. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the warning of the 2020 annual meeting? I, 2022 I, I, annual meeting? Or 2020 with Walia? No, you're moving. Yeah, you're moving. Um, do I'll have a second. second. All those in any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. We have a budget passed. I will wow. Sign it Thank now. you so much, Grant. Thank and Libby and, and just the whole a, team. A, a reminder for the community on February 28th, we'll have the informational hearing. So we'll go through the whole thing again right before the budget vote. Thank you very much for your patience as we went through this. Thank no, you. Thank, thank you much. for your patience. You, uh, much you. appreciation to you, Grant. Shake up some spin drifting. <laughs> <laughs> Rhett, I will say also the CLA is aimed at providing equitability to the funding system. So different municipalities can't game that system. That's something that you can explain as well. There we do a standing ovation. What's what is Grant leaving? Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Thank you. He didn't like that at all. Yeah. Uh, I loved every second of it. J Jim, there were two warnings in our board packet. Did we just vote on both of them at the same time? Or do we need to vote on the second one? I think the, the second one was a re... The second warning you actually approved last meeting, except it was for the, the career center. Right. Um, however, we were sent some, some updated language right. that was very minuscule. Um, so we technically already approved that one, but we wanted to make sure you had the new language in it too. Okay, we don't have to reapprove it. Re it. Yeah. Oh, it was in the yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Right. I had the same question. Excellent. Thank you. Um, third reading of policy D seven special education. Do we need to vote on the increase to the FTE for special yes. ed? Yeah, we do. Or, no, uh, for English. ELL. Oh yeah. ELL. Sorry. I'm sorry, not special ed. ELL. Yep. So um, let me just talk about it real quick. So you know what okay. you're. Voting, voting on. on. Yep. Thank so we for... have a new um, family. We may have two more uh, families from Afghanistan, but they're getting settled and trying to find housing arrangements. So they may or may not come to us. So, which is awesome. Um, and they're absolutely the most beautiful children. And because of that, we need to increase the EL services um, sooner rather than later. You just approved a budget that has this, this in it for next year. Um, but we, we definitely need that service now. 
Um, so it's a total cost, additional cost of $12,618 to get through the end of the year for us to move Laura Rooney from a 0.6 FTE to a 1.0 FTE. You already have the staffing? Yeah, great. And where will you draw the 12,000 ish? We um, always underspend in our salary lines. Okay. Um, for multiple reasons, but uh, Grant's, Grant's not concerned about this impact to our budget. Okay. Is it new hires or? Currently, Laura Rooney sir, is a 0.6 FTE, and she was working as a part-time employee actually over at the Historical Society, um, and so she most definitely wants to move to 1.0 FTE. So no, sorry, we don't have to hire society. anybody. Brett, you're not going to get that answer for a while. Sorry, sorry Historical Society. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're not getting that answer. Sorry. <laughs> um, do I have a motion to approve the increase to the English language FTE? Yes. So moved. Yeah. So moved. Second. 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 Any second. discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. That passes. Now we're on to the third reading of the policy D7 special education. Um, any comments, notes, or edits? Otherwise, it'll it's still be manual, in. right? Huh? Yeah. No, we should ask them about that. That's just uh, not they're, they're not the right people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Parking up the wrong tree there. Just kidding. <laughs> Different branch of government. Um, not to be a nerd. But. All right, so that will <laughs> that will appear in next week's I consent or next meeting's consent agenda. Yep. Um, excellent. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Can I give an update of the enter? Sure. So we had four Zoom meetings at the BIPOC and LGBTQ special ed and uh, literacy. I am finishing up just compiling all of the notes in one document to send to all of you through the administration. I did want to just that, uh, you know, for some, we want to give to send the notes to those special pockets and say, you weren't here. If you still have time to give us some more feedback. So there's like a little form with the notes from the meeting with that express, like if you have families in literacy, they can just like put this in a Google form. So I just wanted to update you all of that process. And so I'll be sending what we have right now in the next few days. Um, and then, you know, I think we will still have that as an ongoing kind of this process. It was very rich. Um, I, I, you know, took notes for the BIPOC. I ended up staying for the LGBTQ because Juliet didn't take notes and V, who was from Outbride, was like, just take the notes. So I just like took the notes. And, uh, and then um, Mia did the literacy and then I took the notes for the special ed. So it was, it was really just beautiful and, and nice to have contact with them. And, I do believe that we wanted to do another one for families, low income families, that, but I don't know like what capacity we have to send out the notes. Now I think we'll just do like a few meetings or lunches, like pop-ups in Zoom. So not like just here are like the four and then, you know, each of the school board can just take one, not so much like affinity yeah. board, but just say the board will keep be here to listen so we can come up with a few in the next few weeks and just see it. Thank you so much yeah, Amanda for spearheading that and yeah and for helping and being present and listening. It's great. Yeah no, absolutely thank you. You're gonna did I hear you say in the beginning you're gonna get us the notes? Yeah okay yeah, and the Saturday Oh, there's no rush right now, okay. believe me. <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> rush. I'm like Just, a week behind. Believe me, I will be on my computer <laughs> on Sunday morning. But... <laughs> Excellent. Our motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Thanks, everyone. Congrats on a budget. Yay.
Thank you. Bye, everyone.